Well, hello there. Live from Newcastle, New South Wales, East Coast, Australia. It's uh, early evening here. And this is our first uh, experimental broadcast for MMT Ed. And uh, we're making progress on that project. And I'm uh, uh, really appreciative of all the small donations we've been receiving so far that's, uh, that's going to make it possible for us to get moving on this project. And um, so uh, tonight I'm uh, talking also for um, the Australian group Modern Money Australia. And this was uh, meant to be a, a scheduled talk in Sydney, followed by one in Melbourne. And I, I do those regularly. And of course, uh, with this uh, lockdown stuff, uh, all my speaking engagements have been cancelled and we're just progressively reconstructing them in uh, using this sort of technology. So welcome and uh, for wherever you are in the world, uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, uh, I'm hoping we can all catch up in person again in due course, although the Australian government has indicated we probably won't be opening the borders for at least into next year. We'll have to wait and see. And um, the earlier screen you saw for today, International Workers' Day. So I'm very happy to be working hard in the in, right into the evening. And uh, for people who uh, know my views, I think uh, cleaners and nurses are the most important people in the world and they should be paid the most. And I think that uh, importance is now more than ever evident. So let's get started to, on, on the talk. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, how a modern monetary theory understanding conditions the way you think about fiscal policy, especially in a crisis like this. What, 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 what methodology and framework uh, does a person who has an MMT understanding use to evaluate and to come up with ideas? to um, uh, ameliorate some of the disastrous consequences of the, uh, uh, not only the medical crisis, but then the subsequent government decisions to contain that crisis. Now, one of the important points is that uh, um, the Australian government in particular adopted this concept called hibernation. And it, it was saying that, oh, we're just going to uh, uh, hang in there in lockdown and uh, keep the economy intact so that when we come out uh, we'll be able to pick up the pieces again. And that's really been their, their fiscal strategy. Now from my perspective, people who know my work will, will know that where we, where we went into this was nowhere we'd want to be when we come out. And uh, uh, the legacy of 30 years of neoliberalism has left the Australian economy, and, the, and it's not just Australia, this is, a, this is a global phenomenon we're talking about here, uh, has left our society and our economy and our natural environment in, in a crisis situation. And it's really... Uh, uh, even though all the headlines at the moment are coronavirus crisis, it's, it wasn't a few, a very long ago that we were increasingly worrying about the climate crisis, and that hasn't gone away. And so all of these things that uh, I've got to learn to point the right way, all of these things here are uh, uh, defines is that we needed to address those things um, already and uh, I estimated for Australia so that to address some of those things particularly uh, the underutilisation of labour, the uh, degraded education and training systems, our degraded public infrastructure, we were probably already two and a half percent of GDP too short in terms of fiscal policy. Uh, the, the Australian government was obsessively pursuing surpluses. It nearly got there, but but nearly got there caused a lot of those things. 
uh, created an environment of uh, really excessive fiscal drag. And uh, so my estimate is that in, in, in appraising the, the current intervention, they were really two and a half odd percent of GDP behind the eight ball anyway. So let's uh, look, at, look at recessions. The typical recession looks like that, a sort of V shape, slightly asymmetric, where you can remember economists talk about investment in terms of capital infrastructure on productive equipment and plant and what have you, capacity. And they get spooked and uh, slow down their spending. Uh, that causes uh, uh, layoffs to occur. Consumers then get spooked and s stop spending. And as a consequence, uh, we, we have a recession. And uh, that can be very deep, but it's typically a short dive down to the trough. And then in the, in, as, as that's happening, governments typically introduce stimulus packages which, which stop the rot and lead uh, to ch reinstate confidence. And, uh, uh, and then there's a slower shift upwards in growth. One of the reasons for that is that uh, business investment is irreversible because you know, large plants, you, you can't take them back once you've done them. And so in the, around the trough, businesses are very cautious as to renewing investment in best practice technologies. And they wait a little while until uh, they're sure that the, the growth path is reinstated. So we talk about a V-shaped recession. They're, they're sort of not quite V-shapes because there's that asym asymmetry. Uh, they can be very deep and damaging, but they tend to be short-lived a few quarters. Uh, typically. Now we've got another class of recession and this was a global financial crisis and uh, they, they, they've they been termed balance sheet recessions. Now the trouble doesn't begin in the production and spending sector initially, the trouble begins in the financial sector and in the balance sheets of households and firms, their, their assets and their liabilities and typically we, we see this type of uh, crisis beginning with uh, uh, being preceded by a massive build-up in uh, private credit and uh, accumulated debt and uh, eventually uh, the private sector becomes extremely uh, susceptible to uh, small shifts in uh, parameters like interest rates or employment levels or working hours and um, the debt is so, so burdensome that that starts to lead to insolvencies, bankruptcies, and uh, uh, and so you get the financial the financial crisis begins, and then that feeds into the real economy. Now you, the difference in shape there, the stylism uh, doesn't matter really. It's just a long drawn out recovery. the The difference is because the way out of that type of recession is that households and firms have to restructure their balance sheets. In other words, they have to reduce their debts and that means they have to save, increase their saving rates for uh, longer periods of time, uh, uh, for a long period of time. And what that process requires is uh, continued and substantial fiscal support. So the government has to support income growth Product, GDP growth, income growth, and that growth allows the uh, non-government sector to, to, to increase their savings and run down their debt back to safer levels. And uh, so how long was a piece of string? Well, it could be a decade of support. And if you think about the GFC, that was a balance sheet recession. The problem of government responses uh, in the GFC was not that they didn't all intervene with stimulus, it's just that they withdrew those stimulus packages variously in different countries much too early. Uh, to put, a, put a, a fine point on it, uh, we're 10 years after the GFC approximately, or 11, and my estimate is the government should have been supporting uh, their economic growth processes. We've elevated 
relative to normal size deficits right through this period till now. Uh, but they didn't and uh, so you saw the uh, uh, slowdown in growth and, and maintenance of elevated levels of unemployment. Now the current crisis is a bit different to both of those. It has elements of both because uh, typically a recession is a demand side event that is a spending event that, you know, motivated by business firms reducing spending and that leads then to multiply effects that uh, um, feed back into household consumption spending and what have you. Uh, whereas in this case we've got, we've got both sides of the story, the production and output story and income generation story. We've got both of them operating. We've got supply constraints uh, at various levels of intensity. So, you know, initially China closed down its factories and that created problems for um, a manufacturing sector which uses just in time and based upon Chinese components. Uh, we had uh, uh, firms uh, forced to stop to close around the world, uh, which, which, which further impeded the supply chain. And, and why that's important is because it means that a, a generalised fiscal response in terms of just a spending stimulus is, is, is possibly uh, damaging. Why? Because it means it may well come up against uh, bottlenecks in the supply side, which then create inflationary uh, impulses. So you start, you start getting into a situation where you could get a stagflationary environment where you've got the elevated unemployment and, the, and also uh, uh, price spikes going on. And it's also obvious we've got the, the typical demand constraints operating and getting worse, but they're not necessarily driven by uh, the sentiment issue. They're, they're uh, in part because workers have been told they're not allowed to go to work anymore. And so they've uh, variously lost their incomes and uh, stopped spending. And because uh, a range of our activities are now constricted, uh, we're, not, we're not spending uh, in the diverse ways that we normally do. We're not going to the sporting events or music events or pubs or thank God, gambling uh, and, and all the rest of the things that we spend our money on. And so there's been a massive, not only a work has been laid off by government dictate, but also they're getting laid off because the business has collapsed like uh, uh, air travel at the moment. Um, so in that context, a generalised stimulus isn't possible. And so we must carefully target the stimulus. Now, just some, uh, some reality checks here. This is Australia since uh, at the beginning of the year. And uh, this, this data goes back. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll get the updated data. This is a very innovative data set from the Australian Tax Office. We've never had weekly employment data before. And uh, uh, the ABS is collating this data from a new payroll system that the ATO have put in and uh, they're publishing it every two weeks. So we're getting it a, a, a week or so late, but it's better than a month late, or in actual fact, six weeks late by the time they collate a labour force survey. And, and just in that last week of the data that we have already, uh, Australian employment collapsed 6%. Now, it's unprecedented. I, I've been doing time series analysis all my career, and nobody's ever seen anything like this. Now that means that the unemployment rate was about 5.2% at the start of this. That means that we've we're already within that week, unemployment probably went above 10%. Uh, and uh, this just gives you, you probably can't read the uh, sectors. This is all the industries. And the red line there is the average for all industries. But you've got uh, accommodation and food services uh, here, you've got that uh, collapsing by more than 25%. That's all the, that's the lockdown. And all those workers have been shared. Uh, 
and those workers tend to be the lowest wage, most precarious workers without any uh, protections built into their employment and uh, uh, they're, they're seriously in trouble now. Uh, this data was just released yesterday. This is the rise in unemployment benefit recipients. And you can see that uh, along the, the, the horizontal axis, that's from February 28th, week by week. And uh, uh, the, the jump has been spectacular. And we've now got more than 1.4 million people receiving unemployment benefits. And if you, if you think about when we started the crisis back around you know, uh, Mar well, on March 10, we had 718,000 people officially unemployed. Well, if you look at this data, then we've, we've uh, more than doubled that. And if you then think about that in terms of, so this is more recent data than the employment data. If you think about that in terms of the unemployment rate, I did the calculation yesterday, that means the unemployment rate's over 12%, probably around 12.8%. Now, how does MMT think about all of that? Now, this is my standard sort of warning. Uh, and, and I keep seeing it in the papers and on social media and the rest that things like, well, if we move to MMT, things will be shocking if you're a critic. Uh, if we move to MMT, things will be great if you're a progressive person. They think it's uh, the liberation from neoliberalism and uh, uh, some sort of path to nirvana. And uh, so there's this storyline out there that MMT is a regime, uh, a set of policies that we move to. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. And as I've said, for people who have heard me present over and over again, I make this point at the outset, that MMT is a framework it's a lens, it's a method of, it's a vehicle for achieving a superior understanding of the system that's out there. So at the moment, if you characterize the system as a neoliberal system of policy and ideology, well then what MMT is, is just really allowing you to understand that in, in, in the monetary consequences and the capacities of the government and what they're doing of those capacities to understand that more fully. Now, there are no MMT policies, and I know that uh, uh, confuses people sometimes when, when in another breath I uh, will say, oh, we advocate job guarantee. But it's a sort of subtle, subtle point uh, the job guarantee is, is, is something more inherent as a stability framework, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult calling it a pure policy intervention. But the point is that to operationalise that lens, that understanding about the capacities of the currency issuing government, and, uh, and the consequences of doing one thing or another. Uh, it, to operationalise that into policy, you need to add an ideology, a set of values. And then you can you define a policy set. So a person like me who uh, would like to think I have progressive value system, I believe in collectives and uh, helping disadvantaged and public goods and public uh, infrastructure and public education and public schooling and uh, uh, health care and all of the rest of those things, then I'll come up with a different set of policies based upon my MMT understanding than a person who's on the, say, the right to be crude, who, might have a, who will have exactly the same understanding of the way the system operates but we'll have quite different policy set. So it's really important to, 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 to get this right at the outset. Now, the, the other thing is to understand context. And, uh, and I've got it in, in normal presentations, I have a set of decision rules, but they can be summarized in this way. Uh, 
uh, in, in relation to the current crisis. The two questions that, that, I, that I ask uh, when I'm thinking about policy interventions uh, first of all, does the nation enjoy monetary sovereignty? And if the answer is yes, which includes the US, Japan, Britain, Australia, almost everywhere, it doesn't include the 19 Eurozone countries that use a foreign currency, the Euro. So if you answer yes to that question, the next question to ask is, is the economy fully employed? And if the answer is yes, well, then there's a real resource constraint operating on government spending. Because let's just say the government chooses uh, as part of its political agenda to implement a wide scale green transition, which requires it to take command, extensive command of uh, productive resources that are currently being used because if the economy is at full employment. Well, then what it has to do is deprive the current users of the use of those resources. If it doesn't do that and it tries to compete with the users at market prices, well, then it will drive an inflationary spi uh, spiral. And so in that context, there's a number of things a government can, currency issuing government can do, uh, including taxation. And taxation is a vehicle to reduce our purchasing power and reduce our ability to make commands on productive resources. And the way I like to express that is that uh, the tax obligation creates the real resource space which the government can spend into without generating inflationary pressures. Now if our answer to the second question is the economy fully employed is no, and that's clearly the case in this situation with the crisis, that's the context, then there are no constraints on government spending. There are political constraints, but there are no financial or real resource constraints. So the government in that case has all the financial capacity it needs to bring all of the idle resources back into productive use in one way or another. Now what that means in a crisis which is a combination of supply and demand constraints, that's the interesting challenge. But we shouldn't get caught up on the uh, idea that the government uh, doesn't have the financial capacity to bring all of the resources that are productive resources that are currently idle back into income earning productive use. And the question is how to do that. And so these are the things that go around in my head uh, when I'm thinking about the, the policy intervention. What can government do to avert a general collapse? So what, it's got spending and taxation tools in fiscal policy. Uh, monetary policy clearly isn't going to do the trick because it's relatively ineffective anyway. It has uh, ambiguous if not perverse outcomes and uh, it doesn't enjoy all of the uh, uh, capacities of fiscal policy which I'll come to in a moment. So what, what, what can the government do in terms, the, the general statement is that the government, uh, there's no reason why there has to be even a recession. Uh, but, how, but how does that manifest in terms of uh, uh, implementation of fiscal policy. And I think the second important point, and it's certainly going on, it's certainly being asked and uh, workshopped by the right, is what do we want to change about the pre-structure of the economy into the future? Now the Australian government's already making noises. There was a Productivity Commission report a while back and, and that's sort of like the free market agency of government that does uh, structural and industry sector research analysis. And that report said that the government should be pursuing a whole range of agendas uh, uh, which you know you can summarise as being uh, 
further deregulation of uh, labour markets, product markets, uh, urban planning processes uh, to encourage more uh, urban and city developments and construction. And, you know, the government is clearly working on an agenda to, to, to accelerate the already neoliberal agenda that created that legacy I introduced at the beginning. And uh, so, so and, and they're implementing their, within their fiscal introduction, intervention, they've already uh, got the unions and the Labor Party to agree to a wage cut, for God's sake. And how, how it is that the trade unions and the Labor Party have agreed to a, basically a wage cut and particularly a lockout of the most disadvantaged workers without any fiscal support, the more than a million casual workers that don't receive any benefits from the wage subsidy scheme, how, that can, how the Labor Party and the progressive forces have agreed to that is beyond comprehension. So they're working on an agenda and from the progressive side, we've got to be articulating an agenda too and uh, incorporate that agenda in all of the uh, fiscal interventions that we propose or put pressure on the government to consider and implement. Now this, uh, this radar graph is the way I think about design principles. Now if you can't, if it's not really clear to you, the dimensions are how quickly the implementation speed of so this is how we appraise any particular option and the criteria uh, implementation speed how quickly can the the money it's it's quite clear that money has to get into the economy very quickly currency spending from the public sector uh, how quickly can it get in there uh, so for example uh, uh, a cash handout paid into all bank accounts is immediate, whereas a, a contract to build a new piece of public transport is not going to be immediate. And the, the, the point about this is that uh, uh, you've got to time the fiscal intervention uh, to, to support the cycle. And one of the, one of the criticisms by the Conservatives in the past uh, during the 70s, which really led to the neoliberal uh, uh, attack on the, the use of discretionary fiscal policy and, the, and led to the uh, monetary policy being made prime, uh, the prime stabilisation tool, was that by the time the government gets its act together with the time lags of implementation, design, and by the time the spending's entered the system, the private sector is already starting to recover and so you start to push too much spending in and cause cost pressures. And so that's a consideration in terms of implementation speed. My bet is in this crisis is, is very deep. It's obviously the deepest in, it'll be deeper than the uh, Great Depression I suspect. Uh, and so there's going to be a longer period before the non-government sector recovers than in that typical recession I showed you at the beginning. Uh, a second criterion is labour intensity. So if, you, if, if you're worried about unemployment and employment, which is clearly has to be central to this because that then defines income, spend, non-government spending, uh, savings, uh, debt repayments, uh, servicing your housing requirements and all the rest of it. It has to start with employment. Uh, then you want, for every dollar you spend, you want as much employment saved or created as possible. And so um, a, a fiscal intervention in a time when unemployment was uh, rising dramatically that uh, decided to build a, a big new uh, piece of public infrastructure uh, uh, which, which would tend to be relatively capital intensive and also uh, s slow in duration of effect um, may not be the most appropriate thing to rely on.
there's uh, uh, one of the other criteria here is the multiplier and uh, that's the, the typical spending multiplier and that's how, how um, much extra non-government activity do you get as a result of every dollar you spend. Now typically we, ob we obviously believe that the fiscal multiplier is well above one and uh, it's, you know, these things are fairly rubbery but if it's, a, if it's above one, well then every dollar that's spent by the government leads to more than a dollar uh, total output once all the transactions are worked through. Uh, so the idea is that the government saves one job and so that worker's income is uh, saved and that worker's uh, spending then in a local shop or wherever they, they spend their money is also saved and that stimulates further spending. Uh, another criterion here is spatial. Uh, uh, this is particularly important because we've often got a disjuncture between the social settlement where people live and the economic settlement where their jobs are. And uh, uh, what neoliberalism has really done is, is, is really made that, uh, broken that, li uh, that link that used to define the full employment period uh, and, and caused hollowing out of regions and uh, uh, particularly uh, a lot of the young people moving into the urban cities, where, urban centres where the jobs were. And uh, so say in, in uh, the interior of New South Wales here or Victoria or any of the Australian states, You've got a lot of uh, towns that were previously vibrant supporting a local labour market with uh, tiered services and what have you. They're hollowing out and you know, becoming geriatric centres essentially because the youth have left, there's no work. So um, uh, that's an undesirable outcome. Uh, and and uh, so fiscal intervention should be mindful of spatial consequences. We don't want to accelerate those things. Uh, another criteria at the bottom there is green, so obviously I'm uh, advocating a green transition and so we don't want uh, spending on coal-fired power stations and um, <coughs> things of that variety. So it'd be, and, and this is where this temporal element comes in because we want to clearly worry about implementation speed to get jobs protected and moving away from carbon intensive industries and what have you. Uh, supply chain. Um, this is this is particularly important now because uh, we don't want to be pushing spending into areas that are going to just come up against the supply chain lockdown and just generate inflationary pressures. So we've got to be thinking about what policies we're wanting to create, uh, uh, intervene with to protect jobs but not to see all of that money just coming up against the supply brick wall. Uh, equity, uh, clearly as a progressive person I'm interested in uh, uh, fairness and equity. And so if you think about the US stimulus at the moment, there's quite a lot of currency being, uh, liquidity being injected, but not much of it's going to the bottom end of the income distribution and a heap of it's going to the top end of the distribution. And so any, uh, from my perspective as a, pers a progressive, I want uh, our interventions to be uh, equitable. And the last criterion is low corruptibility. So one of the problems, of, and this is a, a very typical uh, accusation made of government programs, and uh, uh, it's an ongoing criticism that uh, governments are op uh, programs are open to capture and corruption. And uh, the, the allegation is that uh, those sort of problems don't uh, exist if there's market determination of resource allocation because the market allegedly weeds out the corruption because uh, ultimately a corrupt operation will be inefficient and non-competitive. Now, it's dream world to think that, but, but it's not dream world to think that uh, every government allocation has some corruptibility uh, some capture, some rent seekers, and we need to uh, reduce the incentives and the capacity to do that. So here's just a brief comparison. And, uh, 
I'll, I'll go back here because uh, a perfect policy is that blue outline that scores high on all of the desirable criteria and a shocking policy is a red dot in the centre that is scores the lowest uh, rating on all of our desirable criteria. Now just as a comparison, uh, the, the job guarantee I've given it some indicative assessment points from 0 to 100. It scores very well on implementation speed, it can be implemented straight away. It's labour intensive, it has high multipliers. It's spatial because the jobs go to where people live and want to be. It can be designed to be 100% green. Uh, it, it may have some supply chain issues because we're not sure where the workers will spend their income. But because they're low income workers typically uh, who, share the, who, who disproportionately share the burden of unemployment in a crisis, they're more likely to spend their money, their, their income increase on food and housing, which is less likely to exacerbate uh, imported supply chain type issues than otherwise. Uh, it's, it's not quite fully equitable because uh, uh, the, the type of jobs that would be offered may uh, lead to some skill-based underemployment, uh, by which I mean someone with a, uh, say, a, a professional job uh, who loses their job in the collapse uh, may think that they have higher skills than are necessary to do a base grade job guarantee job. So the jobs aren't designed to match the skills of the unemployed 100%. So there's some inequity there. And uh, it it's obviously would have some corruptibility because it's a government program. Uh, you know, uh, local organisers sort of receiving payouts, paybacks, uh, to put people on the payroll without doing anything, you know, whatever. Uh, and the red and the blue assessments relate to a wage subsidy and loans to business. And you can see there inside the extremes of the spider web, and these are just indicative uh, assessments. And, um, uh, you know, uh, creating a lot of loans to businesses in a deep crisis may not be very effective at all. It, it, it's a, a slow process because of the assessment required. It's certainly not labour intensive. It uh, may not have any multipliers because it may not have any spending effects. Uh, it's certainly not spatial and uh, uh, it's certainly not equitable and uh, it's probably uh, prone to corruptibility. And one of the reasons for all of that is that um, in a severe downturn, the last thing that businesses want to do is go further into debt, particularly when they've gone into the crisis with significant levels of debt. So that's just a way of thinking about different policy options. So here are some things that are, I, I believe the Australian and all governments should be doing. Uh, um, my view is that uh, Wage subsidies paid to employers are not the way to go. They uh, are, are fairly ineffective schemes and particularly wage subsidies that result in wage cuts. Uh, particularly ineffective schemes. They're, they're open to corruption and uh, we're already starting to see reports of, uh, in Australia of uh, uh, some rather dodgy behaviour going on with business firms. You know, phantom phantom uh, payrolls and things like that. And so my view is that uh, if, if uh, lockdown laws force a worker not to work, then the government's responsibility is to pay those wages in full. No wage cut, just pay them in full. And uh, there's no financial constraint on the government doing that. There's no inflationary pressures emerging from that uh, necessarily. And uh, it avoids all the secondary problems that we've been talking about in Australia and I guess elsewhere, uh, such as what do you do about uh, people with rental and mortgage contracts and uh, what do you do about other nominal contractual commitments. And so there's all of this uh, pushback from, <coughs> excuse me, landlords 
of why should they be forced to take a rent uh, a holiday just because the workers are, are breaching their rent leases. Well, you know, these are complex equity arguments and uh, legal arguments, but if you just pay all the workers their incomes, you obviate those. So in terms of uh, our criteria, uh, it looks fairly good across the criteria that I outlined before. Uh, the, the, the most effective thing that a government can do in a downturn is direct, introduce direct job creation. And um, while there's a significant number of workers forced into unemployment, uh, off, off their normal work, some of them are receiving the wage subsidy, at least a million casual workers in hospitality aren't. They're, they're, they're the job seekers that I showed you the spike upwards before. Um, the, the, in terms of context, uh, and, and I'm thinking Australia here, but I, I, if I go anywhere I could come up with the same arguments. There's a significant number of uh, things that a workforce could currently do that aren't being done uh, that, that uh, could be done on a temporary basis without any long-lived consequences. Um, so for example, our food harvest is typically uh, produced uh, or, or executed by uh, backpackers. Now if our external borders closed and likely to be closed for the rest of this year, then a lot of workers who have been displaced from hospitality, accommodation, entertainment, arts and recreation, all the rest of it, they could be offered a job to, to work in those areas temporarily while, while the lockdown continues. And uh, Australia had a bushfire crisis going into this crisis, which wiped out massive amounts of uh, regional infrastructure. So all down the east coast, a lot of those towns are in dire shape uh, with uh, roads melted, with uh, telecommunication systems melted, with lots of uh, houses burnt down, and all of that has to be remediated. And a lot of jobs there that could be created in the short run which don't, don't need a lot of uh, training and uh, uh, skill development, that I'm sure workers in those along the coast who who are not working in the cafes or the entertainment sector could be offered and they probably would really like the chance to do, continue working at their current incomes, uh, uh, doing those type of things. And of course, that's pretty high ratings on our criteria. Now, it's got some equity issues here and some supply chain issues and a bit of corruptibility, but generally scores very well. And uh, the perennial favourite of job guarantee. And this is a unconditional job offer at a socially inclusive minimum wage. Now, what a socially inclusive minimum wage means is that uh, it's high enough that you can enjoy life as a citizen, going to sport, going out to dinner a bit, going to entertainment, going on a vacation. And uh, so you're not excluded from the things that define uh, uh, normal operations in our society. Uh, now we did, yesterday on my, on my blog I released our latest uh, analysis of this and that'll come out as a quite a detailed report in the next week. But uh, the, 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 go the government has, has, the Treasury Department has said that uh, uh, we would have had 15% unemployment if the wage subsidy hadn't come in. And all, what we'll end up with by next month is 10% um, unemployment. Now, before the GFC, we had 4% unemployment. Before this crisis, we had 52 so what we did was an experiment. So what that tells you 
is that the wage subsidy is grossly inadequate. Because if it's really uh, uh, only protecting 5% of the labour force, which is about 680,000 jobs, then there's another seven or 800,000 workers that are going to become unemployed. Well, that tells you that the fiscal intervention to date is either very poorly designed or hugely inadequate in uh, quantum, and I'd say it's both. And so what we did as a mental experiment was say, OK, let's say that the Treasury is right and we'll end up in June with 10% unemployment rate. And let's say we want to get back before to where we were before the GFC, 4%, which, is, which at the time we were arguing was already too high anyway. But it's just a calibration exercise. And that means we'd have to create 824,000 odd jobs. Now, if the government introduced a job guarantee and we've got a very detailed macroeconomic model that uh, generates these results uh, based upon tax clawbacks, unemployment benefit clawbacks, multipliers, <coughs> uh, corporate profits and all the rest of it, uh, indirect taxes and what have you, then uh, a, a job guarantee would have to create 712,000 of that 824 and the multiplier effects, that should be 111.6 thousand there. So the introduction of a job guarantee creates significant work for disadvantaged workers in the public sector, but through the multiplier effects from the extra spending uh, that the job guarantee workers have over, uh, because they've now got an income and not an unemployment benefit, uh, that also generates work and profits and activity in the non-government sector. And that's so 712, 111. And the net investment for that, once you've got all the clawbacks on tax and uh, uh, saving in unemployment benefits, etc., is 26 billion. Now, if you think about the uh, job keeper, which is the wage subsidy, that's 133 billion over six months till the end of September. Uh, that's meant to protect 5% of the labour force. Well, a job guarantee under the way we design it uh, protects six percentage points of the labour force and over a year would cost or require an investment of $26 billion. It's sort of a no-brainer. And it also scores very highly on all of our points. It could be implemented immediately. And what I'd recommend is that for all, all workers that were unemployed on March 1st, they should immediately be employed in the job guarantee. And all workers that were employed on March the 1st should receive either a direct job at their current wage or receive their current wage if there's nothing they can do that's safe uh, in the interim and uh, what you would see would be that the job guarantee pool would shrink a bit uh, but that would protect both cohorts. We're moving on. Uh, another intervention is social housing. Uh, not many people are talking about this at the moment but I always talk about it and uh, that's because we've got a huge number of Australians that are homeless. We've got a, a, a massive housing affordability problem in Australia where you know, the 30% of your disposable income is the benchmark, whether that's affordable or not. And we've got more than a million people in a population of, uh, you know, a, a labour force of 12 or 13 million. We've got more than a million uh, paying significantly more than 30%. And uh, the estimates of uh, social housing, so this is housing for low income groups, is about 400,000 shortfall. Now, we've also got the construction industry faltering. And so uh, 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 it, would lead, it would be a massive introduction now, spending stimulus now, but it also would have desirable <coughs> longer term impacts. And so on our score sheet, uh, I'm just looking at the time, we're OK. Got another about five minutes. Uh, uh, there is a multiplier that's been calculated for that 1.3. So for every dollar spent, you get $1.30 extra national income. And that scores pretty highly on everything. The housing could be made green. Uh, it could be implemented fairly quickly. 
uh, because there's already social housing projects going on. Uh, it's obviously labour intensive and uh, it may come up against supply chain constraints because already there's a couple of large scale uh, public transport projects in uh, Sydney and Melbourne and uh, there's rumours that concrete's running out and stuff like that. So uh, uh, it's not quite as fast, of course, as a, a um, direct job creation program. So let's just uh, last few. Uh, so a lot, lot of, lot of people say, well, this should be a time when we really improve public infrastructure, and I agree with that. Uh, and some of the targets could be to improve our national broadband network. It's, it's, uh, uh, especially with people working from home and, you know, this is streaming from a, a broadband connection uh, tonight. Uh, the, the, the original plan, Fibre into the Home in Australia, was tampered with by the Conservative government when they took office some years ago because they said, oh, we couldn't afford it, you know, the typical neoliberal macroeconomic uh, fiscal lies. And they've ended up with an absolute disaster, which is not delivering fast speeds very much, which uh, requires very, ex to get fast speeds, I'm, I'm streaming on 100 megabytes input tonight, but that costs a lot of money. And uh, so uh, it would take very little to rejig the NBN to restore the fibre to the home, given that I think at the end of this crisis, more people will realise they can operate from home offices and uh, a, lot, a lot of health interventions are being done on the internet now and faster internet, more reliable internet is going to be the way to go. And I would also make, uh, I would also stop the ridiculous idea that the a national broadband company has to deliver commercial returns. This is this is a public enterprise that's uh, delivering essential services, and one of the new forms of poverty in Australia and the world is information poverty, access to information, and the ability to do that. And uh, you know it's coming up uh, at the moment with uh, school closures, where kids from poor families are finding it very difficult to. Uh, educated home because they don't have the fast internet connections uh, and so I think that a lot of uh, a, a good intervention would be in there it could be relatively speedy now I'm not putting up a report card for this because it varies according to them uh, I would um, with a with a eye to the future I would immediately uh, implement solar and uh, battery storage for all low, low income houses housing uh, M massive advantages to people with low income and uh, interestingly at the moment the energy companies because a lot lot more Australian households are using solar panels the energy companies are trying to get the government to agree so that they can actually control the flow of energy on people's roofs uh, 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 to suit their own profit agendas uh, What's desperately needed in Australia is a fast train system down the east coast. We really, you know, from Melbourne to Sydney's nine hours, from Sydney to Brisbane's uh, uh, nine or ten hours, from Newcastle to Melbourne's uh, ten and a half hours uh, by a trip by road, uh, by plane, you know, an hour and a half. Uh, and uh, there's been a talk ever since I've been an adult about creating a fast train and. Uh, and you go to Japan, I was in Japan, of course, in November, and hello to all my Japanese friends there. Uh, the bullet trains are just fantastic. E even the European train system is, uh, is good. And, um, you know, when I, was, I, I took a train from Paris to Cologne last, uh, uh, well, yeah, last year, and uh, I calculated... Uh, the speed we we're going at, how long it would take to get from Newcastle to Sydney, and it currently takes about three hours by train, it would take 39 minutes on a fast train. Now, a lot of the groundwork's already been done there in design and stuff, and they always just say they can't afford it. Well, this is the time to advance that as, as a long-term futuristic project that would have some short-term impacts, not, a, not high multipliers yet, but it's worth starting uh, and, and 
public building maintenance is a, a lot of public buildings and bridges and infrastructure have been run down by state and federal governments running uh, obsessions about surpluses. Well, there's a lot of work that could be done there and that could be done very quickly. Okay, last couple of uh, points. Um, I also think the Australian government should uh, dramatically in use its currency capacity to dramatically increase foreign aid at this time. Now, the, the, all of the UN members signed up to uh, a commitment many years ago to uh, uh, bring their foreign aid levels up to 0.7% of gross national income. And uh, a lot of countries have, uh, have obeyed that, uh, have honoured that agreement. Australia has been a total disgrace. Currently we're at 0.19% only. And uh, we, we wonder why there are people uh, who, are, who are trying to get here from damaged regions, either regions that we've uh, supported and been part of military actions and destroyed their country, or regions that are uh, facing environmental problems. Uh, we're wondering why people are desperately trying to escape those regions and get on boats and come to places like Australia. But uh, my view is that, uh, especially in this crisis, we're, uh, we're allegedly all in it together, but of course we're not, because uh, Australia is able to so-called flatten the curve because we've got a, a, a very good health system. But I'm really worried about countries in the Pacific and in, in some Asian countries and some certainly African and Latin American countries, uh, the quality of their healthcare systems. And, and as a citizen of the world, Australia could uh, uh, create stimulus in those countries. Uh, and on the report card, uh, it's not gonna do much for us in material terms. It will have dramatic uh, uh, impacts in the countries that receive our aid and I think it would uh, restore some decency uh, uh, in our national uh, discussion about ourselves uh, because it's quite embarrassing at the moment being in my view in Australia in the way we treat foreign aid. And uh, as, as a final statement uh, uh, you can learn a lot more about uh, modern monetary theory and the, 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 the background to the, the way I talk about things by accessing our recently published textbook available from Macmillan. So uh, thanks very much. And uh, I've got this chat window now and uh, uh, I agreed with uh, Modern Money Australia that we could... Uh, take some questions and, uh, and uh, for a while, maybe 15 minutes, it's now 8.30. So I'm gonna read some of these uh, questions. Uh, if you've got a question, post it now because there's too many there for me to read. Uh, but if you've got a question that you'd like me to discuss or if you wanna criticize what I've said or expand or uh, think laterally about it, then please do and I'll uh, see what I can uh, uh, come up with in the next 15 minutes. So I'm just watching the screen and uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, I'm just looking here, that's... Marcus Champ has asked, what can we do... Uh, hold on. Did you say unemployment was 12% Andrew McLeod? Um, we don't know what it is yet because uh, the, the official data hasn't come out. Uh, what we do know is that uh, we've now got this weekly data set from the Australian Tax Office. The ABS are publishing that every two weeks. And what we know is that is employment up till April 4 in the week to April 4 collapsed 6%. And we now know as of yesterday in uh, submissions made by the Department of Social Services to uh, Senate Estim uh, the Senate Select Committee, on the COVID-19 crisis, uh, that uh, a, a recipients of unemployment benefits has, has uh, more than doubled in, in the last couple of weeks. 
So if you put that in and make some assumptions, and if you read some of my blog posts this week, you'll see that it, it's likely that the unemployment rate official is, is over 12%. But, but they haven't declared that yet as a result of the Labor Force survey. We'll get that, that data in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm just looking here again. What can we do to help MMT University? Well, we're not calling it MMT University at the moment. And the reason for that is that there's uh, legal implications of calling yourself a university and you have to go through a very rigorous and uh, bureaucratic accreditation scheme and uh, we're not going to be able to do that just yet. That's why we changed the terminology and we're calling it MMT Ed. At the moment we're seeking funds and uh, you'll see that I, occasionally I request funds, uh, the generosity of donors. Uh, we're in negotiation with some large donors at the moment but the crisis has really put a spoke in those negotiations. And you can also see a donate, a PayPal donate button on my blog um, on the uh, right hand menu of underneath the calendar. And, you know, all, all small donations are really appreciated. And uh, as we build uh, administrative infrastructure, uh, at the moment, my research centre coffee is subsidising all of this, you know, we're cross subsidising activities. Uh, but, but over time, as we accumulate a bit more funding, we'll be able to accumulate better technology and uh, uh, classes will start pretty soon. Okay, I'm going to ask, look at another. Uh, what about personal debt reduction? Um, and that's a question asked by Zoltan Bixley. Hi, Zoltan. Um, the, the reality is that we entered this crisis with household debt around 185% of disposable income. That's totally unsustainable. And some of the uh, work that I that you will have read on my uh, in blog posts, I've done statistical analysis, uh, looking at over time the way in which household debt rises and the impact upon consumption growth in segments. And what is quite clear is that uh, as household debt goes above a certain threshold, consumption growth then takes a, a dive. And uh, the most recent uh, national accounts data is showing quite clearly that consumption growth is uh, slowing quite quickly. And that's uh, 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 combined with uh, negative growth in business investment and uh, fiscal drag coming from the pursuit of surpluses. That's why GDP growth has been so low even before we went into the crisis. Before, remember, before we went into the cr crisis, uh, labour underutilisation rates were 14%. That's underemployment plus unemployment. 40, and that not long before that, the government was claiming we're at full employment. And so personal debt has to come down, there's no doubt about it. It, it leaves the household sector in an incredibly precarious position and um, the only way you can really bring that down is uh, tie to financial regulation, but also sustain support from, for growth and employment growth and wages growth from government deficits. That's been the missing link. Uh, uh, the, the, the pursuit of surpluses has really driven uh, uh, growth to, to the levels that uh, uh, wages growth has been virtually zero. And so uh, households have been maintaining uh, uh, consumption spending growth and uh, staying afloat through credit. And that's been adding, the, the flow of credit's been adding to the stock of debt. It's unsustainable. Um, what is the best tax system? So, uh, uh, what's your, sorry, what's your view on, on a debt jubilee? And, and the screen's scrolling quite quickly, so it's quite difficult to... to um, uh, and if I've missed your question because it's gone off the screen, post it again at the bottom and we'll see. Uh, debt jubilees are a difficult thing. Uh, and one of the reasons is that... Uh, do, we just, do we just disregard the uh, rights of the, the lenders? Uh, we presume that the the loan contracts uh, were entered into in good faith. Uh, 
on both sides. Now I know that's not all, I know that's not uniform and there's coercive relationships and all the rest of it. Uh, but if you just start wiping off debt, then um, you enter equity issue. You know, you, you start encountering equity issues. Um, I prefer to sustain income growth and let people work through their own debt problems uh, with a sustainable level of income. The problem at the moment is that the Australian government and most governments around the world are not sustaining incomes of workers and so they're then causing those secondary problems uh, of debt default and what have you um, uh, which, which are unnecessary if they maintain income growth. But, but in the long term, also what's required is that uh, the banking system needs to be brought to heel and uh, stop being casinos. They, have to, they should uh, be forced to maintain all of their, uh, their assets on their own balance sheet. So any loans they make, they hold. They don't off, offload, uh, securitise them up in, offload them to unwitting investors. And so that's a long-term need that we need to get involved in. But at the moment, I think we maintain income growth. Okay, I'm going to look again here. If we increased our foreign aid in Australian dollars, wouldn't that lead to demand for Australian products and service? Malcolm Gordon, Gorman. Uh, possibly. Uh, uh, but that wouldn't be the motivation. The motivation would be to improve public infrastructure, public health systems, public education systems, uh, public employment, uh, environmental care services, and uh, lift material people out of material poverty and uh, allow them to uh, uh, meet the challenges of climate change. That's the motivation. Whether it comes back to us in material benefits through our exports is not the motivation. It may, some of it may, some of it may not. Uh, Bill Mitchell, uh, this is Bijou Smith. Bill Mitchell is, and I'm at the top of the list here, is there any particular country you think could be close to adopting the MMT lens? I've looked around a bit and cannot find any. Well, I've been looking for uh, uh, 25 years, mate, and uh, we're, we're, we're in, as I, you know, in my last lecture tour of Europe and Britain, I talked about that we're somewhere in the, in my view, in the midst of a, a, a paradigm shift. And uh, more and more people are realising that the, uh, the storyline they've been fed by the mainstream economists doesn't really match the reality. And uh, so, so, for example, I often point to Japan as being a demonstration model of uh, MMT principles. Uh, because, and the reason I use Japan is because in terms of the mainstream sort of thinking, they're the country that's been at the extreme of policy parameters, quite high fiscal deficits. So they've typically had deficits above 10% of GDP uh, meeting crises and uh, quite high gross public debt and uh, uh, significant uh, Bank of Japan purchase of, um, of uh, 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 Ministry of Finance debt and uh, significant holdings of public uh, uh, public debt and uh, all you know all the things the mainstream economists predicted and they've been you know these predictions cycle through the from the 90s through to now that um, they'd get escalating interest rates bond yields would rise eventually bond markets would stop funding the government accelerating inflation and all of those things haven't come to fruition exactly the opposite and the only school of thought that's been able to consistently explain the dynamics of the Japanese economy in macroeconomic dynamics the monetary economy uh, dynamics is modern monetary theory without question this, uh, so I'm up back at the top of the list uh, I'm just trying to find what's the best tax system to complement MMT. Uh, John Bow, John Bow, yes. Um, look, I'm. Uh, th this is a uh, an area where you need to be a specialist. 
and uh, uh, to to discuss the structure of taxes and uh, the the equity implications, the so-called incidence of a tax, who in other words, who 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 bears the tax, uh, and the, this is an area of specialisation that I that I have that that I haven't entered into, and so I can't give authoritative input into that. Sorry. Uh, Uh, David says, how do you consider the public inefficient belief, the idea that the private market can allocate resources efficiently? Well, think about the GFC. Uh, that demonstrated categorically that uh, uh, the private sector doesn't allocate resources efficiently. And think about all the privatisations that began in the 1980s and accelerated through the 1990s. And the, uh, the, the storyline there was that uh, uh, by taking those uh, activities out of the public sector and putting them into the uh, private sector, market discipline would uh, enforce efficiencies and uh, so on and so forth. And of course, what the, the broad experience across the world has been that the major privatisations have not been efficient. They've increased, uh, uh, you know, in Australia, energy is a particular one. Uh, uh, costs of energy are outrageous. The uh, reliability of our grid now is in question. There's now blackouts in summer and uh, uh, not efficient at all. And so I think the general point is that uh, uh, there's efficiencies can be uh, in both. It's not a question of ownership. It's a question of organisational design and uh, uh, people you choose to work, to, to work in those areas. And that's not a, not a monopoly of the private sector. Uh, Tom Sheridan, uh, where do you think there may be supply bottlenecks? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, probably in a number of areas, uh, particularly in... Uh, uh, for some countries, you know, South Korea is an example of that's really got dramatic supply bottlenecks. Uh, less so now, but certainly in March in in their motor car industry, because uh, they rely on just in time, and a lot of the components that come from China, and uh, when Chinese factories close down, uh, their systems uh, uh, were shaken to the point of being non-operational in some cases. In Australia, we don't have the same uh, uh, manufacturing intensity, uh, but we know that some of the very large uh, uh, public transport construction projects that have been ongoing for a couple of years now in Melbourne and Sydney, the uh, Connex, West Connex, and uh, the, uh, the, the big uh, metro project in Melbourne, we know that's uh, putting a strain on uh, trades people and uh, some building materials like, as I said, uh, concrete, cement. Uh, uh, I, I think that there will be some supply bottlenecks coming up in food uh, production because of the uh, problem of uh, 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 harvests and that's why I think we should uh, uh, encourage work, uh, hire workers to help in that process. But it's a case-by-case -case analysis. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm just looking again. Does universal or national basic income fit somewhere in MMT? Matthew. Well, uh, I don't believe it does. But um, it, this is not a question of whether it fits into MMT. It's a question, does it fit into my value system? Uh, the government clearly can afford... To, to implement an, uh, uh, a universal basic income. But the problem within a, from an MMT perspective is that if it only does that uh, and uh, all government spending then is chasing goods and services at market prices, which effectively that means, 
then you're still operating in an unemployment buffer stock system. And so your, your price anchor and your inflation anchor therefore requires variations in unemployment uh, if you get a, an inflationary spiral. And so in, uh, I th from an MMT perspective, that's a real problem. And that's why we advocate as a stability framework, and this comes to the point I made earlier about whether you can consider job guarantee be, to be a, a, a policy or a, a, a piece of derivative logic from the basic understanding of the government as a monopoly issuer of its currency that can set the prices by the price it pays for labour through a job guarantee. And uh, the, the job guarantee is superior from an MMT perspective, uh, not only because it uses an employed buffer stock uh, as an inflation anchor, uh, but it actually has an inflation anchor. And it's the government uh, uh, buying off the bottom, if you like, and not competing with uh, market prices for, for a resource that provides it with the inflation anchor. Now, from a value system, I find uh, progressives who advocate uh, UBI to be rather strange characters because effectively uh, they've bought the line that unemployment is something that the government can't uh, do anything about, so that's core neoliberalism, and that the uh, humane thing to solve the poverty consequences of unemployment is to give people a handout, a UBI. Uh, whereas I prefer to, uh, from an MMP perspective, to, to, re to know that the government uh, that issues its own currency can buy whatever's for sale in that currency, including all idle labour. And so the question of uh, mass unemployment is not a financial constraint, it's a political choice. And uh, I prefer, and, and I also understand that the social values are uh, in our Western societies and other societies that I've worked in as well. Uh, uh, prioritise employment as a activ human activity uh, that delivers much more than just income. It delivers social recognition, social location, self-esteem, sense of purpose. And, and a UBI basically considers uh, uh, an individual, not a collective, doesn't talk about society responsibilities, and it considers uh, the in it constructs the individual as a, uh, a consumption unit. And the, the responsibility of government is not to create an environment where the individual can prosper in a social sense as well as an income earning sense, but it constructs the individual as being someone that we need to give a dollop of uh, uh, income so they can maintain s consumption and not starve. And I find that a really uh, diminished uh, uh, construction of uh, humanity and uh, society and um, uh, government responsibility. And I've heard all the arguments, oh, you know, th that I just want to be creative, I just want to do my own art. But uh, uh, those arguments are very individualistic and very neoliberal because who's going to make the food for you and who's going to uh, deliver the other services that allow you to just do your art? And from my value system, I think we've got uh, public uh, uh, collective responsibilities to each other to help each other as best we can through, through work activities. Uh, okay, I'm going back to the top of the list. Uh, what time is it? Yeah, we'll, we'll go for another 10 minutes. Uh, who should decide, this is KB, who should decide what jobs people do under a job guarantee? How is it different from a social security payment? Well, um, if you go to my research centre, Coffee Centre of Full Employment and Equity, www.fullemployment.net, go to Reports, Publications, Reports, 2008, and you'll see a, a more than 300-page report we did where all of those questions are answered. The general point I'd make is that uh, the job guarantee is funded by the currency issuer, so in the Australian context, that's the federal government. Uh, in Britain, national government, uh, uh, but is operationalised at local levels. And because it's the local levels that know what the unmet community and environmental needs are. So it's not a top-down 
type issue, the, the top down funds the programs because they're the currency issuer and the bottom grassroots does all the design and implementation. And uh, we, we produced in that report, so go to Coffee, go to uh, Publications Reports 2008 and you'll see it. Uh, very detailed institutional structure within the Australian context, but it's trans transferable into, into other institutional structures using the principles we developed. Uh, I'm just looking for the next question. It's a lot of comments. Thanks very much. Um, do governments first need direct... So this is from Heimel. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Uh, do governments first need direct monetary financing from the central bank, like the Bank of England has done, to do a larger deficit spending? Now, this is a, this is a great question because this is where a lot of uh, uh, um, misunderstanding of what MMT is about and what, how governments actually operate. So when you think about it, a, a government like the Australian government is spending every day uh, uh, in implementing programs, transferring currency uh, from the government sector to the non-government sector. And it does that by government departments like Treasury instructing Minister, uh, Department of Finance, uh, uh, instructing the Reserve Bank of Australia to then credit bank accounts for, for, to satisfy procurement contracts, make transfers to uh, uh, income support recipients, all the rest of it. That's happening every day. Uh, and then what it's doing as well as that in terms of operations like uh, uh, putting numbers into other accounts uh, uh, like bond accounts, uh, debt accounts and what have you, is really not relevant to the, the spending's done, it's gone, it's a flow, it's out there as soon as those numbers are typed in. And so you, you immediately understand that all of this stuff about money printing is just an absurd... Uh, emotional construction and, and, the, and the people who talk about it uh, deliberately know that it uh, triggers emotional and irrational uh, responses about governments doing any spending anyway. So governments are just crediting bank accounts all the time and uh, the central bank is just typing in numbers for, for governments to do that. Now, then the question is, well, should the government issue debt to the non-government sector? Well, once you understand MMT, you know that it doesn't need to do that. And, uh, in a, and, to, and to a certain extent, it's a hangover from the Bretton Woods system, the fixed exchange system, rate system, where the central bank had to manage liquidity to, as part of their agreement to manage the exchange rate. And in that sense, the, the fiscal policy had to be consistent with that. Uh, but, but in this fiat currency era, the Australian government doesn't have to issue any debt. And indeed, there was a debt inquiry in 2001. Uh, and this, this arose because uh, the, the Howard Costello Conservative government that was elected in 1996 started to run fiscal surpluses. And of course, didn't reissue debt that matured. And as a consequence, the debt, the, the government bond market started to become very thin. In other words, it started to not be very many bond instruments trading in the secondary markets. Now, what, who complained about that was the, uh, the Sydney Futures Exchange and the big investment banks. And uh, the government held an inquiry. Uh, Warren and I put in a submission uh, where we, uh, we were the only submission to argue, as I, under, as I recall, that the government just should stop issuing debt altogether because it really had blown the cover, hadn't it? That uh, here they're running surpluses and the, it, the financial markets are demanding debt when they've been running this narrative all along that the debt was to fund, the, the debt, the, uh, was to fund deficits. Uh, and so they really blew their cover. And what the uh, federal government agreed as a consequence of that inquiry uh, 
was that they would continue issuing a, 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 a volume of debt each period that satisfied the, the corporate interests of the speculators in the investment banking community. And of course, they want the debt because they know it's risk free. So all of this talk, oh, governments are in danger of uh, defaulting. Everybody knows that's not true. And so they use that debt to both price their more risky assets off, but also as a safe haven when the, the financial markets are, are becoming a bit gloomy. They can always park money back into the risk free asset. And uh, um, so, th so there's no reason for the government, Australian government to continue issuing debt and the MMT position is quite clear that it shouldn't issue the debt. Now that means, well then, how does the government uh, 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 spend the same way it does right now, crediting bank accounts? Now if you wanted to have the hoopla where the central bank uh, buys the debt itself, which it used to in the past, well then why do that anyway? It used to do that. Uh, and in effect, that's what's happening all around the world at the moment. I mean, the Bank of Japan now owns about 45% of all Japanese government bonds. The, the PEPP program that the ECB's just uh, implemented is buying, if you see the daily volumes, massive amounts of uh, public debt and uh, uh, effectively funding deficits. Uh, the Ways and Means account was referred to in the question, I think, this is an account, like an overdraft account in, uh, in Britain. It's a hangover from older periods. And this is just like an overdraft where, and, and it's typically justified as an account to, to smooth out liquidity when there's uncertainty in the bond auctions or something, you know, the timing uncertainties. Um, uh, any drawdown of that is just... Uh, the central bank creating the funds by typing in numbers and the government not issuing commensurate amounts of debt. So the MMT position, uh, as I represent it, is that the government should dispense of all of that institutional machinery and uh, just credit bank accounts. And uh, what the, the, the core MMT uh, theory and uh, operational understandings are that that is not, doesn't increase the inflation risk and uh, just just eliminates the corporate welfare. So we'll, we'll have a couple more questions because it's getting up to nine o'clock. Um, oh, I'm just looking. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed your question, by the way. It's funny people think of, uh, think of stimulating the arts. Why not fund them with profit wages instead? Bijou Smith. Sorry, you've had two questions now. Uh, look, as most people who who are aware of me know, I play in a, a band in Melbourne. All our gigs have been cancelled at the moment. We're working out ways to interact on the internet. It's not easy with uh, latency and uh, lags, but we'll see. There might be a pressure drop concert coming up. <laughs> um, I'm a big supporter of the arts. Arts are an absolutely essential uh, se sector of our economy. And... Uh, 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 they're, the, they're normally the most underfunded groups and they suffer dramatically and they're suffering very dramatically now. And uh, they would be, uh, I would all, uh, even without this crisis, I would offer a job guarantee to, to the arts sector so that they could uh, have stable incomes because uh, most, most people, and you know, I've been in that sector all my life, most of the people I know are not really interested in high incomes. They're interested in stable incomes and uh, secure income. And they're interested in being creative and being artists and musicians. And uh, uh, they're prime targets for me in a job guarantee. So uh, maybe two more questions. Uh, I'm just looking here. Why is financial foreign aid important since other nations also have sovereign currencies? So someone called smooth acceleration. Mm. Um, one of the insights of modern monetary theory, and, and I've worked a fair bit in developing countries over my career, is that um, having your own, and, I, and I'm currently uh, liaising with uh, the groups, uh, 
Nodongo and his group in West Africa. Hi Nodongo, and uh, I hope we do catch up again soon. Uh, uh, one of the one of the issues is that, uh, and they're struggling to get their own currencies. They're used, still using the uh, post-colonial French oppressive currency instrument. Um, but one of the points that MMT makes is that currency sovereignty means that the national government can bring back into productive use all resources available to that country. Now, that's a precondition for maximising material prosperity. And that obviously should be done within a, an environmentally sustainable framework. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the level of material prosperity that will be achieved by full productive use will be very high. So MMT, uh, having your own currency doesn't necessarily make a nation well off. And uh, so I see that as, uh, uh, you know, in, in our last book, the book I wrote with Thomas Fartsy, uh, Reclaiming the State, we had a section on the role of uh, multilateral institutions and we advocated getting rid of the World Bank and getting rid of the IMF and creating a new international inst institution that uh, really did channel funds from rich countries like Australia into the countries that were short of real resources. And so when I say channel funds, I'm really referring to rural resources. I'm talking about foreign aid as being channeling rural resources. And so redistributing rural resources across the globe is an essential prerequisite, in my view, for uh, a progressive world and an environmentally sustainable world. Because unless we lift the material prosperity of the poorer countries, and give them employment, hope, and uh, 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 better health systems and education systems, then they're not going to buy a, a, a middle-class, urban, western, green transition agenda. And why should they? Okay, last question. I'm just, and I'm sorry if you've missed out. I uh, love this format. Can we please do it again? Uh, we'll try. Uh, MMT Ed will be conducting public lectures like this in the near future. We're also aiming to uh, uh, have more uh, controlled workshop environments. It won't be through YouTube Live. It'll be through uh, Zoom. And that'll be classes where you uh, uh, have to enrol. Uh, it's not a, we're not asking for enrolment fees. But we need to, they'll be sort of uh, master classes and face to face type sessions where the pupils and myself and our teachers will be able to interact. And we'll also conduct these, these lectures. And once we can travel again, we'll also have go back to the master class concept in, in the major cities and regions. So, last questions. Uh, pool. Okay, we've run out. So um, I, I can't see any more questions, I'm sorry. Um, can we run this at a time when uh, Americans are, aren't asleep? Well, it was, it was 5.30 in New York. Uh, uh, what, what, we're what we're thinking, can, part of our planning process for MMT Ed is uh, when we run classes. Uh, because m most of the time I live in Australia, and so and this is the sort of administrative hub of MMT Ed. Uh, uh, so that gives a problem for particularly West Coast of America if we do this in the evening in Australia. If we do it in the morning, it's different, but then that, ex that makes it a problem for some other places and probably for us. But uh, we're working through that, that issue and uh, there'll be a variety of uh, 
options arise uh, in in the future. And 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 the the other point is that we can store the material uh, uh, and archive it for people to listen to when they want. Okay, so uh, I'm calling it quits there. It's uh, nine o six in the evening here. I just want to thank. Uh, Joan Flanagan and Dallas Lewis, you've been great in, in helping set this all up. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everybody who took the time out, uh, wherever you are and whatever time of day it is, uh, um, uh, and uh, for listening. And uh, I'm hoping you got something out of it, hoping our time was worthwhile spent together. And uh, remember... Uh, uh, Workers of the World Unite, it's May Day, it's still May Day in Australia and uh, uh, in unity we've got strength and unless we'd, we've got uh, progressive policies that prioritise work and equity in work, we're not going to get anywhere in a progressive agenda. So uh, thanks very much everybody and uh, stay tuned, keep, uh, keep in touch through the MMT Ed or my blog or uh, and uh, there'll be more events coming up soon. Uh, I can't travel much at all. I'm, um, my almost weekly flights have, have been abandoned. And uh, so we're working our way through technologies. And I'd really appreciate, by the way, uh, emails. Uh, if you've got comments on uh, quality of uh, audio or video or style or whatever, it'd be really good to, to get feedback to help us improve the service. And once again, I thank everybody who so far has donated to MMT Ed. We'll get back to you very soon. Uh, it's, there's a lot of people now and uh, small donations, but they're really uh, appreciated and uh, gratefully received. So thank you. And good night, everybody. Take care. This is the end. <laughs>